play and call it work. In this video, we're going to be diving into the lore behind the Hallowed Knights, one of the greatest storm hosts of the Stormcast Eternals. My name is Doug with the YouTube channel 2 Plus Tough, where we cover all kinds of Age of Sigmar lore, and my good friends here at Mini Wargaming have been kind enough to let me come on. Don't forget that in the Mini Wargaming Vault, there will be a battle report that features the Hallowed Knights using their storm host rules in the game. So go ahead and check it out. You get access to the vault free for seven days to see if it's something that you are interested in. Now, in our last video, we covered the Hammers of Sigmar. And if they represent martial prowess of the Stormcast Eternals, then the Hallowed Knights represent the heart and the soul of it. For these warriors, zeal is their weapon. Faithfulness is their shield. The Hallowed Knights were the fourth storm host to be forged, and they view the fight against chaos as a holy crusade mandated by their god for eternity or until there's nothing evil left. If you haven't caught on quite yet, they have a strong religious culture. They venerate prayer, ritual, hymns, artifacts, these kinds of things. And they're so saturated in this religious culture that it even makes Sigmar himself a little bit uneasy. Going a step further, they've even created a system of spiritual law that governs their lives. Disciplines, practice, prayers, oaths, and the like. The primary one, the foremost tenant in this kind of religious law that they've created, is this. Much is demanded of whom much has been given. This means you combine a zealous devotion, extreme martial prowess, and a deep conviction to act on it. Now, we first met the Hallowed Knights in the Realm Gate Wars, specifically in the Realm of Giran, Life, during the book Warstorm. The storm host itself was divided into several battlefronts, but they were really all in all dispatched for two reasons. Reclaim nearby Realm Gates. It was the Realm Gate Wars, after all. These are important strategic locations, but the primary mission was to find Alariel, goddess of life, and bring her back into the Pantheon, back on the forces of order. And as I said, the Hallowed Knights were kind of scattered across the realm of life in general, just trying to find all the realm gates and any clues to Alariel. And just like with the Hammers of Sigmar we talked about last time, storm hosts are so big they can be divided up into many, many battlefronts. But we're going to focus on one of these battlefronts in particular, and these are the forces of the Hallowed Knights led by Lord Celestine Gardas Steel Soul. Now, Gardas is an incredible character. There's actually more Black Library coverage of him as a particular character than just about any other single character in the lore, in terms of the sheer number of books. Now, I want to summarize their role in the Realmgate Wars. Again, this is a super condensed version. Back on my channel, I did an in-depth coverage of each of the Realmgate War campaign books. If you want more detail on what the Hallowed Knights did, go check those out. The forces that Gardas was in charge of landed near a particular realm gate and they took that realm gate at great cost. They fought several great unclean ones and legions of plague bearers. In the end, Gardas saw that what they were trying to do just wasn't working. They couldn't out attrition Nurgle and so he runs into the realm gate thinking he could destroy it from the other side. Well, Gardas barrels through the gate. One of the leader great unclean ones see him, sees him do this, sees what's going to happen and then runs in after him. The thing is he rams into the side of the realm gate, the whole thing topples and all of a sudden we have Gardas trapped in the realm of Nurgle particularly the Garden of Nurgle, with a great unclean one in pursuit, and the rest of the Hallowed Knights clean up the forces that are left on our side of the Realm Gate in Gurion, and then move to their next objective. They just assume Gardas is dead, they all grieve for him, and have to keep on fighting. And through this journey through Gurion, trying to find Alariel, they fight all kinds of chaos. They got mostly Nurgle-centered stuff, so what we would know as Slaves to Darkness, Rotbringers, Beastmen, Clan Pestilence, all trying to find the Everqueen. Again, that's one of their primary missions. At one point during another battle, Gardas smashes out of another realm gate. He literally just ran through the Garden of Nurgle for about a week or two and then came out of another realm gate that led to Garan and met up with his forces again. And I can't emphasize how much I'm oversimplifying this for time's sake. These are incredibly cool stories and I highly suggest reading them. Now, eventually the Hallowed Knights do find Alariel. They keep her safe and they help her become the warrior queen aspect that she's in now. They played a pivotal role in kind of rebuilding the Pantheon of Order. As such, they were instrumental in the opening acts of Age of Sigmar, meaning like the beginning of the actual age time-wise of Sigmar. They are fundamentally the reason why we have Order settlements in Gairan, and they've become masters of warfare in that environment, particularly well-suited to fights against Nurgle. Now, as we dove into the Hammers of Sigmar last time, we talked about the effects that the war was having on them throughout the ages. Because none of the Stormcast have remained static since the start of the war. Everyone's changing 
incrementally. Their tendency towards religious ceremony has led to a new ritual, which is carrying an artifact of chaos with them, which seems kind of strange. They usually bring the severed finger of a blight king or some kind of weird memento of disease, and they use this as an honor badge, right? This is the thing that I survived, much like if we were to go hunting, we would carry a trophy. And their idea is, if my faith can protect me from this, meaning whatever artifact they're carrying, it can shield me from anything. Now keep in mind that those artifacts they're carrying are still exuding disease, plague, pestilence, whatever it is. They're not strictly Nurgle, but this is a good example. So the idea is that my faith is actively keeping me safe, not just it was not one time in this battle. No, it's happening right now. Something that's come up on my channel quite a bit is people asking if Stormcast Eternals can be infected with the plague of Nurgle. And the battle tomes clearly says, yes, they can. However, there's kind of an asterisk next to that. You see the light of Azir inside of them, the literal power of the stars that is inside every Stormcast Eternal is constantly trying to purge the corruption. So yes, your skin is getting infected and rotting and things like that, but at the exact same time, the energy within you is constantly burning it away. So this leaves some of the Hallowed Knights being incredibly scarred. They just look mangled. Some of them have become fused to their armor as a result of this process, this purge and infection cycle because pus will develop and then it'll try to be burned away and it'll get kind of sealed between the armor and the skin and then it kind of gets attached to them and they get stuck inside their armor. It's disgusting. And this can leave a warrior in constant agony and this really leads to the idea of there's no wonder why they throw their lives away so carelessly. We see it as unabashed zealotry just going straight into the battle but they see it as a release. Right, They see this as a religious purification. Right, My suffering will end when I will be made anew on the anvil of apotheosis. This means when they get to this point of constant pain and agony from all the purging and infection, when they throw their lives away, it's like a martyrdom rather than just the cost of doing war. Now, moving more into the reforging, what the, the effects of the reforging process on this specific storm host are quite interesting. We talked last time about the curse itself, the deterioration of the soul and the problems that it can bring with Stormcast Eternals. Well, the Hallowed Knights have a very unique view on the curse itself. They see it as a blessing. In their mind, more reforgings burns away more impurities in them. They don't see soulless automatons. They see stoic warriors of the faith cleansed of any weakness or doubt. Which, from one perspective, is completely valid. On the other hand, it's horrifying as we talked about in the last video about Hammers of Sigmar. For all Stormcast Eternals, many reforgings can lead to like lightning crackling around them as like the power of the heavens is kind of coming out of their physical shell. And the Hallowed Knights see that as a blessing of Sigmar made manifest, as if they were chosen somehow. Like this is some kind of halo that adorns a chosen warrior. So compared to other storm hosts, they have a very backwards view of what we know as the curse. So why is this storm host so fascinating? Well, in the Hammers of Sigmar video, we asked questions regarding the soul, right? What is justice without mercy, etc. You can go watch that one if you'd like. Well, in this video, we're tackling the greatest and scariest parts of religious fervor. And their storm host kind of tackles those questions head on. Because there is a powerful duality to the Hallowed Knights. On one hand, there are the noble defenders of the realms. No one is more devoted and faithful to the cause of freeing the realms. They are unquestionably loyal, warriors of conviction, seekers of truth, and purity. Right? And there's, there's are all incredibly great things. They're things you want in your heroes. That idea of much is demanded of whom much is given, right? We, we love that. We all want heroes who not only are gifted and great, but they see how they need to use those gifts. They have this inner conviction to be the best that they can be. And if you're looking for a paladin, like if you're more of those traditional fantasy types like D&D, &D, paladin types are your go-to, Hallowed Knights really do exemplify that kind of heroism. It's a hero of strong moral character on a crusade to rid the world of evil, pure and simple. However, like I said, there's a duality. On the other hand, their faith takes them to some dark places as the war goes on. For starters, if you like the curse and you think it's a blessing, you must have some very interesting thoughts about the Sacrosanct Chamber who's doing everything they can to stop it. And the Battle Tome doesn't really go into much detail about that, but I want to leave that thought with you. Their fascination with trinkets and artifacts is somewhat disturbing, right? Because it can infect others. If they walk around with that finger of a Blight King, even though their faith constantly protects them and it's this great 
trophy that they're carrying, it can infect a free people soldier standing right there. And their reckless zealotry becomes more pronounced as the ages tick on. Right? They'll purge the evil no matter the cost, i.e. no cost is too high. And if these are supposed to be the leaders of the best, the foremost, and they're throwing their lives like zealots and fanatics, what does that actually mean for the rest of the forces of order? How do they work together? Another question I want to ask you, and just to think about, is what does it mean when they start operating with other order forces? Right, we've already gotten glimpses from, say, the Daughters of Cain book, that uh, there are temples to Cain and shrines and stuff like that, to paying odes to Marathi all throughout the realms, because that's how the Daughters of Cain operate. They go to an order city, build a temple, and that's where they kind of house their forces as they go. We saw in the book Soul Wars, there are temples to Nagash in order cities, and they're just, they're just left alone. You can do whatever you like. It's free. So what does it mean when all these people are worshipping other gods, when a faction you have is so religiously obsessed with Sigmar? Can they govern and dispense justice fairly? Can the population that they're defending trust them to do that? Again, just like the Hammers of Sigmar, where it's like, uh, you ask the question, at what point do we start negating all the good things that we did to obtain the blessings that we have? You get the same thing, right? They fight stoically in Sigmar's name, but for the purposes of freedom, well, when that freedom takes them takes people to other places than Sigmar, right, in their religious beliefs and how they express themselves in their worship, what does that look like to be a hallowed knight? Do you see heresy? My first thought is yes. Remember that Sigmar said himself in the battle tome, he is uneasy about their devotion because he's not infallible. He understands this. He used to be hot-headed, aggressive, made mistakes. He chucked Galmaraz at a reflection of Archeon. And other gods do exist that are better than him in certain areas or wiser or stronger in specific areas. He's not sole deity of the realms. And Sigmar's whole goal is to rebuild the pantheon, this whole collection of gods. And my thought is the singular devoted nature of the Hallowed Knights at some point will become a liability. And I love this. This Stormhouse simultaneously represents the best and worst of the term faithfulness, right? Pure stoicism, bravery, idealism, and utter zealotry and tolerance and a morality that never grows or evolves. It's stagnant, uncompromising. This storm host forces us to look at ourselves. What are we unwilling to waver on? What parts do we allow to grow and evolve? What is the cost of doing either? It's an amazing storm host that gives us true insight into the height and depth and nature of devotion and the soul itself. So friends, thank you all so much for taking some time to learn about the Hallowed Knights with me. And if you'd like to learn more about Stormcast Eternals in general or any AOS lore, head on over to 2 Plus Tough. It's my YouTube channel here, and I have a ton of videos on the subject. I want to again thank the guys at Mini Wargaming and want to direct you over to their vault to check out the battle report going up today with the Hallowed Knights themselves showing off all the cool rules they got in their new battle tome. Thank you all so much for watching, and happy wargaming.